Hey guys, I'm Janelle, and I'm going to show you how to find the limit of a function algebraically. The good news is, to do this, you're mostly using stuff you already learned in algebra. The bad news is that each function is different, and there isn't one way that's going to work for everyone. Some of these can get a bit tricky, but don't worry, that's why I'm here. So, let's do it! When trying to find a limit algebraically, the first thing you should do is try direct substitution. So what you do is just plug in the value that x is approaching into the function. If it works, that result is your limit. It's actually that easy. So we're trying to find the limit of the function as x approaches 2. First, try substituting in the 2 for x in the function. After we plug 2 in, it's just a matter of simplifying. Multiply and combine the like terms, and we're done. The limit as x approaches 2 of this function is 9. It's great when this happens, but obviously it doesn't always work this way. Sometimes something like this happens. So I did the same thing as the last one, but got 0 over 0. And when you see that, you're probably like, what the fuck? Like, that can't be right. Like, is that the same as zero, or is it undefined, or something completely different? Don't panic. This just happens, and we just have to do a little more to get through it. What we need to do is figure out a way to simplify the original function, and then just do direct substitution again. Now, if you're trying to figure out how to attack a limit that comes out number over zero, or undefined, you're really trying to figure out what to do when limits do not exist, or how to find one-sided limits. We'll do that some other time. <laughs> right now, I'm going to show you how to deal with 0 over 0. Here's another function where the result of direct substitution is 0 over 0. When you see higher powered polynomials, like this x squared, your best bet is to try factoring to simplify. Whether the situation is the difference of squares or difference of cubes, a perfect square trinomial, or even a grouping situation, factoring will usually help you find what you're looking for. I know, I know, there are lots of different types of factoring, and I'm not going to go deep into it here. But if the biggest thing you're worried about is factoring, you're going to be fine. <laughs> so in the numerator here, there's a trinomial, and it's just one x squared. This is going to be one of the easiest types of factoring, where we're just looking for two numbers that multiply to the end value and add to the middle value. So two numbers that multiply to 4 and add to negative 5 are just negative 4 and negative 1. Set up factors and we'll move on to the denominator. In the denominator, we're dealing with a difference of squares. Take the square root of each and set up factors, one with a plus and one with a minus. So I factored the numerator and I factored the denominator. And because I like when things work, the one I picked worked. We have a common term on the top and bottom that cancels out. The function simplified all the way down to x minus 1 over x plus 4. Now we can try direct substitution again. So I simplified the function by factoring, then substituted 4 back in for x into the simplified function, simplified that, and got 3 over 8, which is the limit. <laughs> we gave factoring a shot because we saw x squared, and it worked. But of course, factoring doesn't always work, so I'm going to show you another way. Here's another one where I tried using direct substitution and it ended up with 0 over 0. And I don't see anything x squared or anything to a power, so what now? Anytime that you see there are roots in the function, the thing to try is to multiply by the conjugate. In this one, the root is in the numerator, so we need to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. To get the conjugate, simply change the sign in between the two terms. 
For this one, that's the minus sign here. Now we multiply by the conjugate. And don't be surprised that it can look like kind of a mess. You probably remember foiling, and maybe it's not even a painful memory. <laughs> foiling is multiplying the first, outer, inner, last. Here's a pro tip. When using the foil method with conjugates, you only have to worry about the first and the last because the middle two terms will always cancel out. The first term is the square root of x plus 5 times the square root of x plus 5, which is just x plus 5. A square root multiplied by itself always ends up being the radicand which is just everything under the radical sign. The last term is just negative 3 times 3 equals negative 9. So I multiplied the numerator and the denominator and ended up with common terms on the top and the bottom, which is great because then they just canceled out. Here's a quick warning. I was multiplying everything by the conjugate of the numerator. I didn't multiply the denominator on purpose because it would make it harder to find things that cancel. You might be tempted, but only multiply the conjugates together. Don't multiply the terms that are not conjugates. It defeats the purpose. Now that it's simplified, we can try direct substitution again. So I put 4 in for x into the simplified function, and substitution works again. The limit as x approaches 4 of this function is 1 over 6. So for this whole thing, I used the conjugate of the numerator to simplify the function, try substitution, and found the limit. But of course, there's still another way. So here's another one, and no surprise, when I tried direct substitution, the result was 0 over 0. So that's not going to work. There's a polynomial that's raised to a power here. A good thing to try is expanding it and seeing if anything cancels out. When I multiplied x minus 4 times x minus 4, that ended up as x squared minus 8x plus 16. And luckily, the 16 and minus 16 canceled, which left three terms that all had x's in them. So I factored out the x on top and canceled it out. That just leaves x minus 8. x minus 8 can add up 0 over 0 with direct substitution, so it's the perfect time to do direct substitution again. Substituting a 0 in for x, the limit is simply negative 8. Using expansion of polynomials can be pretty easy. I wish it was always easy, but as you've probably guessed, there's one more way. This is the last way, I promise. <laughs> Again, here's one where direct substitution gives us 0 over 0. I keep pointing this out because you should always try direct substitution first. But of course, it didn't work. Dealing with a complex fraction isn't bad if you can find a common denominator. In the numerator, the common denominator is going to just be both pieces combined. So 3 times 3 plus x. By changing the fractions in the numerator to have a common denominator, you can combine them. So I fixed the top by creating a common denominator and combining. That helped, but it's still a complex fraction, and I want to get rid of that. Now I can multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator to get rid of the complex fraction. The denominator is just x, so I'll multiply by 1 over x. Doing that gets us so close. <laughs> well, doing that, the x's start canceling out. 
And remember, be super careful to keep any negatives when crossing out terms. Finally, this is simplified enough. It's time to try direct substitution again. And with a little simplifying, it works. <laughs> the limit as x approaches zero of this function is negative one over nine. Now take a sigh of relief. We got through the worst cases of finding limits algebraically. I really hope this helped you understand how to find limits algebraically. It's annoying because there isn't any single approach that's always going to work, but once you recognize the different situations that come up, it gets a lot easier. I know it's a lot to wrap your head around, but just remember, you don't have to do it alone. And if you don't like math, it's okay. You don't have to, but you can like my video. <laughs> so if you did, please like and subscribe.